Thank you so much. Okay, Zev. Oh, we're live. We're live. It's going now, I think. Yep, live now. It's on? Yep. Awesome. All right. There we go. All right. Uh, still loading on my page, guys. Uh, apparently, we are live. Awesome. Well, we are live. Yep, that's, uh, we're live, guys. Hey, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for tonight. Um, got a couple of our guests that are a bit under the pump for, for time-wise, so we'll uh, get you to go first, Serene. Uh, and then we'll hear from Pete since you guys are under the, under the pump for time tonight, and we'll go from there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Zev, for uh, providing these very important platforms uh, for uh, uniting us together and creating the connections within the community that are very, very important at this time. Um, you know, I feel very, very grateful that, um, you know, we're, you know we, we are connecting together, um, especially uh, when in the last couple of months, um, as a lawyer that has spoken out about what is happening and what, what we've witnessed, uh, the radical changes that are being brought uh, by states and territories, um, uh, the radical changes that even today, you know, I've had thousand messages come today with what the South Australian government wants to uh, implement, um, issues around taking children away to quarantine-like camps or, uh, you know, uh, spaces that they want to set up where um, they take away the parents' agency completely. I I I'm blown away, to be honest. Every day I'm blown away by the things that are being introduced uh, at the state and territory levels. I'm blown away by what I have witnessed in terms of phone calls. I've been on the phones for the last four months um, intercepting and assisting uh, so many people who are finding themselves in situations that truly are, uh, are un unfathomable. Uh, for example, yesterday, a lady called me in distress. Her daughter's come to Queensland from Melbourne. She's got Asperger's and Down syndrome. And, um, and the police has just detained her at the airport and put her in hotel quarantine when her mother is her carer. I mean, things that are phenomenal. I've had to contact the health minister. I'm pleading with the health minister right now, Queensland's health minister, please get this girl out of quarantine and put her back with her mum. Uh, you know, things that are just um, beyond belief. You know, a, a, a young lady at the border, uh, Adelaide, they let the mother go through in one car and then they stop the young lady who's pregnant at 21 years of age and they wouldn't let her go through. She had to spend four days at the border and I had to plead with the chief health minister to get her to cross. Um, I'm blown away. I'm blown away by what I'm witnessing. People every day calling me from hotel quarantines, from... Um, uh, you know, forced vaccinations, childcare, every space, they're not letting them uh, work, they're not letting them see their elderly parents, um, elderly abuse, I mean, I, I'm blown away, elderly abuse in aged care facilities and aged care centres, people are not being allowed to see their families at the moment of their death. Mm. Yeah, I'm blown away. I mean, you know, what do you do? I mean, how many bullies are there that you have to mitigate? I mean, how many fires you have to just put out? And this is about a nation that is now being encouraged to bully each other. When you have laws that are unchecked, when you are saying that in an emergency, anything and everything goes, and all of our processes and all of our laws, whether they're written in the Biosecurity Act or even in the respective public health acts and emergency acts in each of the states and territories, this is not how we anticipate to deal with public health risks. It's an absolute outrage. You don't go around and suspect everyone of being COVID-19. Healthy people are being detained. Healthy people are being asked to test. Families in primary schools and, and, and high schools, if, if someone is found with COVID-19 positive um, test, so that, you know, the RT-PCR test, it's known that if you are positive on an RT-PCR test, it doesn't mean you're infectious. But every single person who's testing positive has been told you're infectious. It's an outrage. And then what they do is, uh, so I've got many parents called up saying that apparently they've been told that, they, that, that their child has been exposed to COVID-19 and therefore they must be tested. 
and they won't even give them the contact. They say, oh, contact tracing, oh, anything goes. Anyone can be contact traced, apparently. But there are prescribed information that you have to provide. You have to let the person know who they were exposed to allegedly. Airport staff being told, oh, you can't come and work anymore. The whole Qantas airport, uh, Qantas staff being released, like not being told to come back to work because apparently one person had COVID and they won't tell them who. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just an outrage. It, it blows my mind what is out there. Um, from a, from got, from a, sorry, from a lawyer's perspective too, must be rather shocking to see that We've got all these laws and rules and restrictions, regulations being imposed on us, yet those imposing them don't seem to be accountable or they don't seem to be applicable to those imposing the rules. Absolutely. It's an outrage. Things that are, we've added the contradictions, the hypocrisies uh, are, are, abound in every space and in every place. And these people, you know, uh, people are calling me traumatised. Mental health issues are exacerbated. Suicides Many families have called me up who've lost someone to suicide. Oh, sorry, I get a bit emotional. <laughs> no, I, I totally understand, Serene. You're like, uh, I feel for you because you're in the thick of it and you're the one who's standing up and you're being that voice for these people that have no voice. And, you know, we get the calls, but you're the one who's at the dead end of it at the moment because what we wanted to do as part of tonight is call out to the lawyers and the doctors and the nurses to step up and have a voice because... There doesn't seem to be enough people right now doing what you're doing and advocating for these people. And when we see the facts and the figures and the death certificates getting changed and the nurses getting coerced to write down the wrong things and the doctors that are speaking amongst themselves, but they're too scared to be deregistered so they won't stand up and make the noise. And it seems like it's all getting funneled to you and you're getting stuck with a big burden. And we want to say on behalf of all the people in Australia and Victoria, Thank you, Thank because you. you're doing so much to help these people and you're coming from a place of love and sincerity yeah, and care, absolutely, but absolutely. you've got such a big burden at the moment. So, you know, I can hear yeah, it I'm in your very voice. Grateful. I'm very grateful that a lot of people are reaching out. You know, it's also managing that level of, um, you know, input that people want to have genuinely. And, and I know, but I, I obviously like thousands of messages on my phone, I can't keep up, you know, but obviously I have to prioritize, you know, uh, for the case and we want to launch. We're so close now. We're looking at Tuesday, Wednesday, launching our class action. The issue is the end to end, you know, I'm looking at the end to end of this process. You know, when you have a state of emergency declaration under the law, you have to ascertain a significant health risk. And there has to be honesty in the narrative. There has to be honesty in the words that we use to describe things. When we say this is a deadly virus, we are being told a lie, a lie. Language is very important because it creates the fear mongering and then it creates the, the perception. Undoubtedly, the biggest killers remain in our society, the cardiovascular disease cancer and respiratory disease. And God knows how many people have died because elective surgeries have been stopped, okay? Goodness me, how many people have mental health issues? And then, well, let's look at the process. Why are they so desperate to put COVID on the death certificates? Hey, uh, so what is this, where we're heckling? Mind. Are we in a heckling process? The doctors are heckling for COVID-19 to be on the death certificate when you've got comorbidity of diseases, terminal cancer, diabetes, uh, or, uh, cardiovascular disease when people have been suffering from these diseases for a long time. Let's look at the statistics and line up last five years and look at, and look, are our ICUs any more higher than they were in previous years? No, the answer is no. Let's look at influenza statistics and pneumonia statistics. Oh, you only have to look back to last year. 3,000 people died of influenza and pneumonia Absolutely. the year before. Exactly. The year before was 2,900. The year before was 4,000. Absolutely. All of a sudden... Influenza apparently disappeared in Victoria, but guess what? The influenza statistics in Queensland and New South Wales, equivalent to this year, apparently they're more. Queensland has more cases of flu than Victoria's cold weather. Yeah. Sunny Queensland has more flu apparently this year than Victoria. How is that right? What well, all of a sudden the influenza knows at the border? Oh no, we can't cross the border now. Influenza says, I can't cross the border. Okay, this is where influenza stops and COVID starts. Where is the honesty? 
You're talking to doctors like they've got no logical, it's logical fallacies that they're, inter, that, that they're talking about. Completely dishonest. And it's in their own statistics. It's in their own data. Australian surveillance flu statistics, you only have to look it up. This country yeah. knows how to monitor itself and therefore you can't, you, you can't ignore a lie. And I think those ones that aren't stepping up and saying something, if you look at the facts and figures for every three deaths from COVID, it looks like there's two deaths due to COVID. So whether that's the elective surgery, the suicides. So there is blood on these people's hands. They really need to look and do a conscious check, conscious, yeah, have a look inside, do a gut check and say, I need to step up right now. Like the time is now to step up yes. and do something and yes. say something. It can't be all to you, Serena, because yes. uh, Serene, because you're taking too much of a load at the moment. But we need people to step up now yes. and do that gut check. Yeah. And I'll say something. Where are all the experts? Where are all the professionals thumping their fists on the table and saying this is unacceptable? If you think for one minute they're not coming for you, for your businesses, for your jobs. For, your, for, for anything you have built in terms of your property and in terms of your bank accounts, don't be under any delusion that you are protected. Serene, can I ask you a, can I ask you a question? Yes. And I've asked this question to, to a lot of people. Where are people like you, like the lawyers, how come more lawyers haven't stepped up to form an alliance or to form a group for the people? Is that something you're working on? I can't work on other lawyers who, who are morally bankrupt. Okay, I can't work on other lawyers that, that, that have no conscience. Okay, I can't work on an industry that has become infiltrated by uh, uh, privileged, privileged rich kids. Okay, most of them come from privileged rich backgrounds. Okay, I have only a handful. I've been going at this for months and I'll tell you what I get from other lawyers. Criticism, put downs. Insults. You're the only That's one what I get from other lawyers. Culture. That's the disgrace of our, our legal fraternity that is yeah. populated by entitled rich kids who've grown up not understanding. All the larger law firms, they've all got deals with the government. Do you think that they have the audacity to stand up or they're worried about their government deals? And the small suburban local law firms, you know, this is not their expertise. Administrative law, public law, constitutional law is not their expertise. But all those that do have the expertise are working for the larger government department and for the larger law firms or the middle class law firms. Mute or critical. Oh, I didn't know about this opinion, Serene. Maybe this opinion is better. Really, you're all screwed. We're all screwed based on what's happening right now. Yeah, because people don't want to open their eyes. It's cognitive dissonance. They're so upset about this. But, you know, I've been at it, investigative. I've been doing a lot of, not just as a lawyer, I've been doing investigative journalism in many ways, gathering the data, gathering the information, looking at their own websites, looking at the end-to-end -end process. How do you report COVID? How do you assess it? hospitalizations how do you codify it how do you clinically diagnose it and then how do you report it at this point yeah it is from the end-to-end -end process it's corrupted and this is by their own words this is by their own information and then you just have to look as i said match up the statistics you don't have to be a genius to go work out something is not adding up here and then when you have families and you have uh, Troy on the, on, on the line today and I'm his lawyer, you know, and, and uh, you know, when you have families who've been traumatized with the death of a loved one, being patronized, being told COVID is the main death, the main factor and the families are having to negotiate going, no, that's not true. <laughs> this is not true. And the, and the doctors are like, no, I don't know. We think so. We think so. Yeah, I've heard that too, Serene. I've got yeah. a couple that had people in palliative care, two, two people that are wanting to talk to you as well. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, but and I want, to, I want to gather this data. This is actually critical data because when you declare a state of emergency, you're declaring it based on your death. Yeah. Now, even on the best case scenario that they've got our causal fatality rate. Now, what's a causal fatality rate? It's a rate that's calculated based on your diagnosed uh, uh, disease, uh, diagnosed with the listed human disease, in this case, COVID-19. Now, we know that they're diagnosing wrong. We know that they're saying you're infected as soon as you get a positive test. 
That's not how it works. TGA and even their own uh, their own information says you have to do it through clinical diagnosis, but their codification is saying right away, as soon as you get a positive, you're probable, you're suspect COVID. Everyone is suspect COVID. Apparently, if you have a cough, you're suspect COVID. <laughs> if you have a bit of sore throat, you're suspect COVID. What is this? This is encouraging um, all sorts of things, and let alone the empowerment of the police and the AFP and, and, and ASIO and all of these organisations, they're being empowered by laws to say that you can just enter homes and enter property and enter this and enter that. And they're choking and they're hating and they're coming at people and they're, you know, it, it's just so disproportionate. But coming back to that end-to-end -end process, you've, we've worked very hard to get the statisticians and the experts at every point in point, whether it's the RT-PCR test, experts in that, and the data in regard, regards to the collection of how do you read those tests and what do they actually tell you. Codification, as soon as you enter the hospital, if you have COVID, you're given probable or suspect COVID. And that codification goes through. So, And then they say, even if you have another condition, even if you have a major comorbidity of another condition, or that you've been sitting in the hospital before all of this and you just happen to test as COVID positive and you die, they're going to put it on you as COVID, as COVID death. Yep, Serene, just we're a bit under the pump for time. Sorry, so, so my apologies. But, but, but as I no, said, you're right. I love the passion, Serene. It's great to see. We need more like you with that kind of passion, yeah, especially I mean, for the legal profession, as you so eloquently put, that are completely bankrupt and void of any kind of emotion or, or spinal balls to do anything about it. So... I, can't I, want to say, I, want, I want to say one thing to the experts. Come forward. Come forward. You know, you know who I'm talking about. To the experts out there. Stop being scared. Everyone is scared. Everyone is operating from a window of fear. Let go of your fear. Everyone knows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Okay. Leonard Cohen, the song, everybody knows. We all know it's a corruption to the extreme. We all know it, everybody inside of them. I'm saying to the politicians, I'm speaking to the lawyers, I'm speaking to the experts, I'm speaking to the professionals, I'm speaking to the business people. Get up, do something. This is your fight. This is your chance to get up and take ownership of the fact that our politicians and our bureaucrats are morally bankrupt. They've sold our land to overseas interests, to foreign interests, Chinese government, tra transnational companies, SEPI and, 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 and you know, these overriding organizations, uh, uh, to technocrats, apparently that call themselves philanthropists. Well, I'm really hoping, Shereen that your passion rubs off on a few other lawyers. So if we do have some other lawyers watching this, this is what we want to see more of you, look. Yep. People with some passion like, and, 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 and take ownership, you know? I, I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm, you know, because a lot of people go, oh, she's anti-vaccine, all of a sudden it's a write-off. I'm here for, I'm, I'm talking about our rights. You know, when you have a, 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 um, a, a ailment or a disease, you need to be fair in terms of your assessment of it. Okay, the laws talk about assessing it from a significant health risk. Is it a significant health risk causing significant harm? Causal fatality rate of 1.38% is not significant. The law itself says you can't eliminate that risk. There's always going to be some element of risk. It's about management, but you don't go shut down an entire country. And not just that, you shut down the smaller businesses the middle class businesses, but you leave the big businesses open. What is this virus thinking? Yeah, big business, I'm fine. I'm not going to attack you. <laughs> Small business, yeah. No, that's where we're going to operate. You know, all the Serene? Yes. So we're under the pump time-wise. Yes, sorry, yes, so that's enough for me. Yes, yes, are yes. on some <laughs> solid time constraints. Again, love the passion. and really hope it rubs off on some other lawyers. Thank uh, you. No, Pete, you're under the pump, and so is our anonymous artist. So I just <laughs> want to hear from you guys quickly before we run out of time to, to hear from you two. If you can stick Thank around. Thank you, Serene. We'll, we'll get back to you and love you to spread some more passion for the other lawyers. We love you, Serene. Thank you so much for being you. And uh, I'm looking forward to many others joining the... Joining the... The resistance. <laughs> They need yeah. to step up. We need to step up. That's for sure. I, I won't speak for too long, but thank you for having me. And uh, hello, everybody. 
uh, what can I tell you? Uh, I've had a background in food for a long time and what I've seen in, in that industry as far as health goes is major corruption. We're all aware of it. In the past, we've seen uh, our government health authorities have been in bed with multinational food corporations and it's been exposed over and over and over again. We created a film called The Magic Pill a few years ago to share in some of that information. And it's, I mean, it's, we all know that that has happened. So when this virus came along and people put their faith in the government and the health officials, and my biggest question so far has been, how come in six months, not one health official or government official has talked about building a beautiful, robust, healthy immune system when this virus me is meant to attack our immune system? That to me just makes no sense whatsoever. Well, it makes a lot of sense because the, if it was about health, then there would be answers and solutions. And just to give you my own perspective, over the last six months, I've been interviewing some of the world's leading doctors that are outspoken in this such as Dr. Buttar, Dr. Shiva, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., um, many, many others from Australia, New Zealand and parts of the world. And the first thing they speak is common sense. And what, what their common sense is, how do we build a healthy, robust immune system? And they take us through it and they ex actually explain how does the cytokine storm happen in somebody? How do viruses, um, how do they work in our bodies, positive and negative? And it's, it's a pretty simple formula. Like it's a really simple formula to build a healthy and robust immune system. And I've questioned that over and over and over and over. When is somebody going to come out? And, and the strangest thing, and I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way, but the only pe person in power that I've seen do this is Ro Donald Trump. He's actually talked about zinc. He's talked about sunlight. He's talked about these things and he's been ridiculed for them. But if there's so many doctors out there that know, functional medical doctors generally, because they have a, a greater understanding of health and wellness than the local GPs, and no disrespect to them, but it's just that they've furthered their education to encompass more knowledge in which they can help their patients achieve long-term sustainable health results. So in saying that, I'm still waiting for somebody to come out and say, hey, you know what, this attacks the immune system. So why don't we all look at reducing inflammation in our body, the first one, and look at the pillars of health that we can all, each and every one of us can do today to be our best versions of ourselves. And, and that's been my message over the last six months is to encourage people to be healthy, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And we all know when we're out of alignment, how do we bring that back to alignment? Because when we are physical physically, emotionally, spiritually strong and present, that's how we can change not only ourselves, but our, our environment, our community. When we're sluggish, when we're overtired, when we're eating the wrong food, when we're drinking too much alcohol, you name it, we're operating at a level or a frequency that isn't vibrant. So my message is let's get ourselves into a position of empowerment in body, mind, and spirit, so that we can face each day embodied, so that we can think critically, we can think clearly, we can take the correct actions instead of reactions, plot a way forward in which we can move this narrative. Now I've said, if everybody in the country switched off their news, switched off anything from mainstream, re removed the fear and exhibited their most authentic self, we would have nothing to worry about. We would have zero to worry about. And in fact, by doing that, we could actually change the health system in a couple of months. I've proven it and people that I interview, we've proven it. We've helped hundreds of thousands of people improve their health through some simple methods. Now, the reason that I do not trust our health officials, and I'm very open about that, is because this information isn't a secret. It's so easy to do. Yet, for decades, they haven't encouraged anybody to do it. 
now in reaction to a potential threat of a virus, which I'm not fearful of in one <laughs> at all, not for myself, not for my family, not for anybody. The reaction has been actually to keep lowering our immune, our immune system, put a mask on. We know that lowers our immune system from science. We know that social distancing lowers our immune system because human interaction is what builds a healthy immune system. We know that staying indoors and not being outside lowers our immune system. So closing businesses down, not being able to leave our homes to see our friends and family lowers our immune system. Fear of financial insecurity and uncertainty lowers our immune system. So it seems to me with a common sense point of view that what the government and the health ministers are doing is actually lowering our immune system on purpose instead of offering solutions so that we can stay healthy individually and as a community. And that's probably all I need to say right now. And that's, um, you know, some people might call me wacky for that, <laughs> for that philosophy. But for that common sense. It's, fu it's fucking common sense and ap ap apologies, but I'm over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's not very, so not well very common. Yeah, I think um, you've sort of nailed it on the head on all those points because, you know, we're watching people who are usually uh, people that I know, people who like out, out and about in my community who are usually vibrant, beautiful, happy human beings coming from a place of fear and they they just don't look like the same person people i haven't seen for a couple of months i see them now and they just look like a shell of themselves because they're they're eating from uber eats they're not exercising they're wearing a mask all day every day and you're just seeing their soul their body and souls floating out of them and uh if they did get hit by even a common flu i reckon they'd fall on the ground now because their their immune system just can't be working well so i think what you said is pretty much spot on um, Can we? We might just throw to our anonymous artist here, guys. There's someone you. who's um, done a fair bit of work in TV and film. Because I know you're under the pump for time. Yeah. So thank we'll you. just call you our anonymous artist. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, love to hear your two cents worth, so to speak, on all of this. And um, applause yours. Go for it. Zev, I'm oh, no, Pete, sorry, if Pete. You need to run. You go. <laughs> thank, thank you so you, much. Pete. You're a legend. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you uh, for having me here. Um, Pete, you're a legend. Thank you for all your sharing. Um, it's uh, been really inspiring. I, I um, I'm myself, yes, my, my work, my profession makes me a professional feeler. So I'm, I'm an actress and I work in film and television and, um, my whole life um, really revolves around my, my own empathy and my body. So I, I literally listen to my body and I've become confident in being guided by what my body tells me. And, um, and I use that in service of character in service of the stories and the films I do. And, and I'm here and I, I don't wanna be anonymous, but I am about to start filming a film <laughs> and um, I do need to be careful about being outspoken because you can get dropped from charities, you can lose uh, campaigns with car companies, you can, all these things um, happen like at the drop of a hat and for having, you know, um, which have happened to me in recent times for speaking out. So I feel, um, I feel, um, <laughs> I feel careful and I don't, I don't want to elicit any um, aggressive uh, threatening responses from anyone, but I, I feel 100% called to, to speak to this topic because this topic, what is this topic? It's, it's, it's about speaking the truth and shining a light on, on the reality of what's really going on. And Deep, deep in my heart, I, I want 
I give everything to um, believing in the good in humanity. I'm, I've thrown my hat over the fence. I believe in humanity and I believe that um, we're magical, amazing, living, uh, you know, embodiments of, of spirit. And it's amazing what we're what we're doing here. But yeah, it's it's also there's a certain level of agenda and darkness that has had authority, and that has had um, a lot of people in just you know believing lies. And for me personally, I started hearing things like this from doctors in in California when I was living in Hollywood, and. I just would hear, you know, just little drips and drops from like amazing doctors who went to Stanford and then um, stepped out of the medical industry because they felt it was, from their experience, it was corrupt. And um, this would go on and on and I'd keep meeting people. And I thought it was crazy. I thought it was madness what they were saying. And I, I and then a few days later, it would come back to me and I'd realize, no, it's true. So all of what they were speaking about is, is what we're facing right now. And um, I do, I do believe, I do feel, or I, I, I was just that up the more loving paint. that we are, the more intelligent we become. And um, so when we are in fear states it's really we, we just follow what we're told and and um i again um what else what else do i want to say i just want to circle back to something pete said about um trump because i watched a very interesting <laughs> video just um today that a friend sent me and it's it was on youtube and it's is trump a light worker and i you know it, he's just such a divider. Like I literally left Hollywood because he came into power. Um, so I'm, I like was not, I was not at all um, on the fence about him. I just did not like him. And then this particular YouTube clip just is fascinating. And all the information that comes out when you actually look at what he might be doing is pretty fascinating and just mind boggling absolutely mind-boggling yeah so um what what else can i say zev uh, i'm oh, um i ask you a quick question are you guys through the industry with with working in media and film and tv yeah. are you yeah. specifically asked or requested not to speak or share your views publicly is there anything that you're sort of requested or slightly implied not to do so or it may affect your work habits or is it just sort of the way it is um well it's not like there's I, I did receive an email from the council asking me to do a video for the community to stay home like a stay home video because of covid um and at that time it was probably a couple of weeks in and i I, you know, saw that there was all these other great people that were doing it. And it was that kind of, it's that sort of thing where you can get looped in without realizing you're being looped in. And um, it was such a short video. So I, you know, but um, no, generally not, not really. It's more, um, of course you can speak out, but I think also maybe those with really strong conscience or strong integrity um, will not just easily um, sell out. So I don't think they're as easy to manipulate, you know. So I, I haven't found myself in that many situations where, where it's like that, but I've certainly navigated some very, very interesting rooms and met balls in New York and uh, Hollywood blockbusters and been in some very interesting spaces. But... Um, Again, I also believe in um, synchronicities and that we um, and divine timing and and in humanity. Um, I yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but does that, does that kind of answer your question, Zev? In what you were yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I think faith in humanity is paramount for all of us at the moment with the the current mm. scenario. We're sort of being pitted against each other in this divide and conquer style strategy. And we've got to have some faith in humanity and stand united. There's no other way forward. So spot on, yeah. spot on. Yeah, and within ourselves as well. Like it's a clean up your own room type of situation. So our own shadows are going to get highlighted as well as the shadows in the world as within, so without. So I do feel it's really um, part of, it's essential in this journey that souls on this entire planet are going through right now is we need to clean up our own room and then we can help others and you know, shed light on what's going on for others as well. May I say something here as well? Yeah. Um, sure. um, uh, thank you so much. You've got a very healing and beautiful voice uh, <laughs> to the artist. It's just gorgeous. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I have to say something. <laughs> it's very important. We must not be afraid to show who we are and show our identities. I am mm. representing many doctors and nurses and people who are coming to me and saying, please, I do not want to show who I am, but I will mm. support you. Uh, and I'm yeah. just saying it's not to, I understand, but I do believe very importantly that we must show who we are, that we must not be afraid to unite together and reveal who we are. I'm representing Absolutely. I'm actually yeah. representing almost... 200 healthcare pr practitioners who I promise them I will 100% keep them anonymous. But my frustration is this I need to show them, like, like I, I respect them. Yes, they're I in. Them, I really do. But I need yeah. those voices. I... It's not just me. I, I can't protect <laughs> you, I can't shield you from the mm -hmm. attack you know we all have to rise and we all have to not be afraid to reveal who we are and to truly yeah. speak and to say no I can see who you are and you and yeah. the only thing that separates me from those that choose to make me believe that I should fear them is my fear Okay, yes, I that's so that. true. I really I, hear I, you on that, Serene, I, and I really I, appreciate you speaking yeah, to this I'm not because criticizing you. Uh, please understand. No, okay? no. This is not from a window of criticism. This is from a window of love. I'm saying we these people only have the power because they've made us believe that there shall be consequences. You see, even the police officer who's wronging another person, the, 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 the very high corrupt official who's wronging another person, they're human too. When they see us rise and say, no, we will not be abdicating in this matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will not allow our liberty and our dignity to be suppressed by what you're telling me you own of me. Okay. So I feel I like own your own, message. Yes. I'm, I'm the owner of my own destiny. And yeah. I don't care. Give me liberty or give yeah. me death. That's what yeah. I stand by. And we all, if we all say, give me liberty or give me death, there shall be liberty and there shall never be death. And so it is. Thank you, Serene. I really do hear you. And I literally said to Zev before I came on the call that if I, if this film wasn't about to shoot next week, that I would, I, you know, I would show up. And it, it is actually oh, quite no, tied to no, what I'm working on. No criticism, please. Okay. And, 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 yeah. and this is about those who are truly influential. Yeah. Okay? I'm saying the doctors, the nurses, the, the, the people who can make a change, mm. the people who know what's going on. Mm. Okay. Speak mm. out. You know, I've had. Well, what's very yeah, sorry, I will stop you. I'm freezing up. Right. And I have to say, I'm so sorry. I have to leave. I love you all. Thank you. Please join the class action when we launch on Tuesday. Love you, Troy. Mm. Okay. I'll speak to you guys soon. Thanks, okay. Serene. Bye bye. Right. Thank you, Serene. Thank Lots you. of love. And you. So, um, <laughs> I was just gonna. I was just gonna put out one thing that I've picked up over this last week, and that's um, and uh. I don't know if um, the artist formerly known as someone else wants to talk about it as well, but um, <laughs> we're getting a lot of com comments. What's happening is in Victoria in particular, there's a bit of an upscale at the moment. So the fear factor has gone through the roof. Um, I tend to yeah. talk a lot about the similar things coming from a place of love 
uh, vibrating at a high level because mm -hmm. we're going in and out of lockdowns we're sort of on a roller coaster so we're up high then we drop low come up and drop low and what it's done is it's inbred this feeling of helplessness within the community and the people that I'm talking to just want people to stand up for them and I totally understand where you're coming from with the film coming up and everything else as well and there are a lot of people that are sort of speaking up in the background and they will come out and talk when they're ready when the, mm. it's, it fits into their lifestyle as well because we all have to be mindful of our jobs and our livings and everything as well and I think um one of the big concerns that people have is about uh, vaccinations. We've just been talking about it in the last week. They're looking to put vaccinations into some of the nursing homes around Melbourne. And I think vaccinations are a thing that people get scared about because we we want as a community, and Serene was kind of touching it on, a, on it before, um, with anything, vaccinations, 5G, anything like that, we want to be able to have pro-choice. It's not about anti this or yes, we'll do that. We want to be able to make choices in our life. And I'm guessing um, when I go back to you, the artist, um, you're about that kind of thing in your life as well, that people should be able to have choice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's a given. Yeah. We might just, guys, because we're pumped for time to not draw this out. Um, how much time have you still got, artist, or are you on the on the clock at the moment for us to come back to you? I probably just got another few minutes. But right. you probably well, we just... more with the nurses and the doctors, right? Well, I'm just going to say we might throw to our, um, our lovely nurse ex that's mm. been very patient and waiting, um, particularly with Matt touching on the vaccines and stuff. We'll get to you very soon, Troy. Sorry to have you on. And if you've got anything you want to say to Troy, just pipe up, mate. And you've sure, said I'm, I'm, I'm patient. Yeah, I'm just happy to listen. That's no problem. All right. Um, well, look, Nurse X, do you want to do a little quick intro? We'll go with our uh, masked agent X up the top in a minute then as well. But might um, go to Nurse X if you can unmute yourself and just do a little bit of an intro and um, fill us in on some of the info you were filling me in on uh, when I spoke with you a couple of nights ago. Hi, um, I'm just coming here. I'm a quite senior nurse, um, probably tonight just wanting to let people understand a bit about the culture. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people bagging out staff in the hospitals and I think a lot of people don't actually realise what happens in the hospital. And what I've watched happen probably over the last 10 years, um, there's, a, there's a very ugly culture in there. That culture is if you have a good idea, or if you speak up, you basically get your head chopped off. I'm seeing a culture where nurses who are maybe a little bit outspoken, nothing radical, are getting pushed out of jobs um, with no references and actually being pushed out of the profession. Um, it's, it's pretty nasty. Um, we are trained from an early age not to critically think, which is pretty scary when you think about what we do. Um, when it comes to vaccination, we, um, we have no training. We are told basically it's necessary. People who refuse it don't know what they're talking about and that these children will die if you don't have it. There's no training. There's no training on the side effects. Um, we don't even know how to educate people on the side effects when they're vaccinated. Um, do I see vaccination reactions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but we're not allowed to talk about it. Um, uh, the other thing I was talking about the other night that people don't realise is PCR testing. So people are under this false impression that PCR testing tests for a virus. So things that you need to know are, one, this virus has never been formally identified. So basically you can't test for something that's never been formally identified. Um, the other thing is how PCR testing works is it doesn't actually test for a virus. It tests basically for a trace of the DNA left behind from a coronavirus. Um, the maker of the test is quite clear when he says this is not to be used for diagnostic purposes. And we've been using these tests for several years now for viruses. Um, I've never been instructed to use them in the way that we're using them currently. Um, we actually causing trauma to people with the testing. Um, I'm not sure, Zev, is there 
Anything else you really want to talk about? Well, if you had a little, I wanted to touch on certainly. Um, how you guys are talking with the vaccine, the stuff you're filming the cinema on um, the other night about nurses being shut off and speaking to each other. Uh, maybe a little bit about how that culture starts to change amongst the profession. Uh, and the fact that you guys who are trained in ICU, etc., aren't getting. Um, you guys aren't getting shifts. And if we're in a pandemic, you'd think that we'd put it more than you on, not sacking you for your views on social media. Yes, well, um, we are warned not to speak. We are warned we will be cancelled. Um, I'm ICU trained. I have not had a shift for four months. Um, and I'm in Victoria. So um, I have lots of colleagues in the same position. The general public are under the impression that our hospitals are overwhelmed. I have never, ever seen our hospitals as quiet as they are now. Um, within these hospitals, you can be working side by side with people who agree with you, but you would never know because you know not to ever talk about it because it's divided. You never know who your friend is and who your enemy is. Even though we have casual banter on a daily basis, um, you you cannot voice these views. If you question um, vaccination, um, vaccinating an unwell um, child, um, you are automatically called an anti-vaxxer. Um, you learn to go about your job and to not say anything. Um, people are under this impression that nurses are free to speak, um, they're not. Um, and those that are awake won't speak and those, a lot of them are asleep. And I can tell you they're sound asleep and they have been well brainwashed for a long, long time on how to behave at work. They won't, if you talk to them, they would look at you in surprise. They don't even know it's happening. It's, it's subliminal. So I'll hand you to Zev. Mm. All right. Well, thank you for that, Nurse X. Well, um, if you're sticking around, we'll come back to you for a bit. Zev, uh, can I just butt in for one minute just while we're sure. talking nurses? Sorry, guys. I spoke to a nurse yesterday from a hospital in the Mornington area, and she was very similar in what she said with the robotics of the nurses there and the inability to speak up. They had a palliative, uh, palliative um, person in their patient and that patient um, tested three times for COVID. All three tests came back negative. The, he, they still got put into the COVID ward because they come from a nursing home. They, on the morning that they were about to pass away, the family came in to say goodbye. The family had to wear full PPE equipment, masks, shields, gloves, the full equipment, while they said goodbye to their loved one who tested negative three times. They never got to kiss or touch or feel the person's skin again before they said goodbye. That person then passed away. The nurses spoke amongst themselves, saying that something's really wrong here with what happened here. The next day, uh, the family came in and spoke to the doctor. Two of the nurses tried to speak up and got shot down by this doctor and told not to speak up or they would be deregistered. Um, and this nurse is just too scared to speak up at the moment. Again, probably going to go through the serene route, but it goes along with what Nurse X said. There is a lot of fear out there for speaking up. There's a lot of that cognitive dissonance that they're stuck in this culture of doing everything in a certain way. But what I want to say is don't be fearful of speaking up because if you don't speak up, and it's a horrible thing to say, but you really have these deaths and these blood is on your hands. You need to find that voice to come out and speak now. Yeah, just to our nurse, actually, you guys, you must see a bit of this sort of stuff in, in your industry and, and where you work as well. Yes, um, um, and I've had a little bit to do around some of the testing, and I won't go into any detail, uh, identify me. But um, what's happening in there, there's a lot of lies going on. Um, well, uh, the um, and that have no to lie to you, but there's a lot of lies that are coming out. Um, these are government organisations, and they are sticking with the government narrative. So, yeah, is this, to, is this to do with the, the comorbidity rates as well, as we talked about the other night?
miss that. Sorry, I'll just do that so we don't get the echo on you. Um, we were talking the other night too about the comorbidity rates. We might be enjoying at the end of this one. This is something a bit close to your heart here, mate. But Nurse X was filling me in a little bit on the morbidity rates and the comorbidity rates and how these numbers have been fudged quite heavily. If you wanted to just uh, enlighten us a little bit on that, Nurse X. Yes, yeah, so what you may hear in the paper, um, then uh, they're not that uh, a lot of these infected people have been in hospital for completely other reasons and they're dying for completely other reasons, um, but they're being counted as COVID deaths. There's a lot of lying going on. Yeah, and I must agree that I'm getting the same thing through my inbox in my Instagram. Probably, again, three or four different people's families, including Troy, that are saying that they're having loved ones that have got... One had um, lung cancer and hepatitis C, and yet COVID-19, he got put into the COVID-19 ward straight out of the uh, nursing home and got marked down as a COVID death. They contested it with the doctor. The doctor then changed it. Now, usually a doctor won't talk to a patient backwards and forwards. So even the fact that that is happening is not, uh, for me, the ethical practices aren't happening here. There's a big, for me, there's a big cover up of sorts that's happening. And I guess, yeah, like Zev said, this is a good time to speak to Troy. If you want to have a bit of a chat and let us know what happened with your uncle, Troy. Yeah, I just want to pull everyone in, Troy, and let them know a bit about your story, mate, for those who haven't seen you all over social media already. Sure thing. Um, I, I mean, I don't even know where to start. Um, so my uncle has, well, he, yeah. Sorry, just give me a second. Um, so my uncle had a terminal cancer for a number of years, and there's a lot of other pre-existing conditions that he had. He was in a nursing home for just almost uh, two years. Now, um, before I get into the story, I just want to encourage anyone that has a similar story like mine, feel free to you know, send me a message. I'm happy to point you in the right direction and Serene will definitely look after you. I can assure you that Serene is a true professional and she certainly made me feel comfortable, especially after my video coming forward. And I had a conversation with her before the video and also after the video and she's been really great to deal with. So I, I strongly recommend, you know, if you're not comfortable, I'm happy to keep you anonymous and we'll have a conversation and try to encourage you to, you know, to, to come forward. But so my uncle, terminal cancer, um, and he's been in palliative care for six weeks. So palliative care for anyone that doesn't know, you're obviously on your last legs. Um, my uncle had three tests done for, for COVID, for the PCR test. The first test came back negative. The second test came back negative. And then the third test came back positive. The positive test came back on August 7th. This was four days before he passed away. So he passed away on August 11th, just to for everyone to think about the timeline. Now, the doctor, you know, thankfully we have a recorded conversation from the doctor um, with a phone call with my mother. And the, the doctor had a conversation with my mother in which we spoke, well, they spoke about the, the, the cause of death, really. The number one thing that obviously caused his demise. And the doctor's opinion at that point in time was that it was COVID-19. My, my mother obviously disagreed with that assessment given the timeline and the history and it is of my opinion as well you know if someone's got terminal cancer like what does terminal mean terminal means that it's pretty much game over for them as soon as you get that announcement if you're at stage four cancer or even stage three i'm not too sure how how it works for different types of cancers but this is a man who was 72 years old his name was errol for everyone that is um is wondering what his name was and he was a great uncle he, he really did a lot for us and he's a very big family man. And I'm sure that a lot of people can probably understand what it feels like to lose a loved one and not just to lose a loved one, but obviously to cancer. And in, in, in some ways it was a good thing that he passed because he had such difficulty just living. He, for, I mean, to put it into perspective, this man wasn't eating solid food for 12 months. So he was not eating solid food for 12 months. This isn't a man that was ready to fight he was he was on his deathbed he was dying and um you know much to the um the, they're obviously i don't even know where to go from here yeah troy i mean it's a hard time as well you like it's not far from 
and our thoughts are with you. You've just lost your uncle, obviously, and it's a lot to go through. It's a lot to process with what happened with the conversation with the doctor and everything else. And I think what you've done is really courageous in stepping up and talking about this um, because, you know, if you think about this, um, what's happening here is we've got a virus that is really 99.75% of people are recovering from this virus. Uh, of all the testing getting done, 0.4% are testing positive. But when they find someone positive, they contact trace that whole area to get as many tests done as they can to fill this narrative in, to do the lockdowns and the masks and everything else. And what we've found as well in our uh, research is the hospitals, and even, I don't know if the doctors are getting it individually, but the hospitals are getting paid, paid for every COVID case that goes through and every bed that's used for COVID and every ventilator. So it's disturbing to know that your uncle, who was already unwell, obviously very unwell, um, a common, I mean, a common flu, the seasonal flu probably would have hit him just as hard as anything else. The fact that he tested negative twice, it makes you wonder if it was just his time. And the fact that your mum had to go through those questions on the phone, it's morally wrong. And uh, the fact that you're speaking up, for me, is one of the bravest things I've seen. I think in such a tough time for you and your family to come out and do this gives that voice to all these other people that are thinking, well, what's happening to me is wrong as well. well. Since you've done it on Instagram, I've had three people step up and do the same thing. So, and we're going to get them in touch with yourself and Serene and, you know, the action will happen from here. But what I was hoping tonight is that we can encourage other people who watch this, who think that something's not quite right, like what happened with you, to step up and speak as well. Definitely. And uh, I also want to make it clear, this is, some, this is an interesting fact. Um, so tested positive on the 7th of August. My mother got a phone call on the 8th. So she's the power of attorney as well. Now, with this phone call from the head nurse, she was told that my uncle was asymptomatic. So I find it very, very curious for all the listeners that, you know, a man that is has terminal cancer, this is lung cancer, by the way, so obviously respiratory issues. So you'd think that COVID would, if, if anything, like logically, would be an issue for a man that has cancer with a compromised immune system, wasn't eating solid food, six weeks was in palliative care. This is a man that was asymptomatic. And I find that concept very difficult to believe as well. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely big holes in that narrative. And I think, um, as you said, people hopefully will get in touch with yourself, myself, and we'll funnel it through to the right places. And um, again, I just wanted to thank you, Troy, for speaking up. I think it's, uh, as I say, very courageous. And I hope you still find the time to grieve with your family and, um, you know, don't put too much time into it, but we're all here for you as well. I appreciate that. And I also want to quickly say that, you know, I was very, very nervous to come out and do that video. And I can assure you to anyone that might be listening to might be considering doing the same thing. I felt so much better for doing it because it, it wasn't just about, you know, my mother, my family, this is about all Australians and about what we're all going through. And I'm, I'm for the people that don't know that I'm in Melbourne as well. So obviously for the Melbourne or the Victorians, we're in phase four lockdown and it's important to get this information out for people to understand what's going on and that you're not alone. And I'm scared, but I still did it anyway. And I think it's important that we all support each other and I'm prepared to support anyone that wants to stand up and that wants to have the, to share their voice and have a, have a strong voice, have a loud voice and have the courage because courage is to do courage in my opinion is an act of, of really doing something when you're scared. And I certainly was scared the other night. No, it's amazing. Thanks, Troy. Back to yeah. you, Zev. Hats off to you, mate. One, for going through what you're going through and, and being brave enough, one, just to face the fears and two, to come out and do what you're doing publicly, mate. That's um, Hats off to you for doing that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, we might throw over to our uh, Agent X, who's been uh, quietly waiting and mm -hmm. uh, cleverly disguised and hooded up here. Just a bit of a rundown for you guys. Agent X is... Um, Bit of a military background. He'll fill us in on a few of his observations. He's down in uh, Dictator Dan land, otherwise known as Melbourne at the moment as well. Um, if you just want to uh, share through there a few with us, mate, um, some of what you've been noticing, maybe like you're talking about before from your training, what you've noticed with the aircraft, other activity, and what you're seeing and noticing. Um, while you were talking earlier, mate, about the way you're dealing with it, you're trained for this. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> mate. Also so, Zeph, thank you very much for reaching out to me and getting me involved in this. Um, 
a bit of my background. So I served uh, for 10 years in the military. Uh, I've had two tours overseas in Afghanistan. So I'm well aware of uh, military tactics and the type of uh, warfare in regards to psychological warfare and propaganda. Um, for me, it, it works on both levels. Uh, it's 50-50 emotional uh, because of my background, how I grew up here in Melbourne, Victoria, and also because of my background in the military. So um, I have a, a very similar situation and a story to Troy with uh, my grandfather. He passed away uh, during the first wave. Um, and same thing, he was used as a guinea pig. Um, they try to treat him as a COVID patient. Uh, we had to go there on his deathbed and uh, wear full PPE gear. And uh, they used him as a guinea pig, just na nasal swab after nasal swab. And it felt like they actually wanted him to, to be positive for COVID to, to push that agenda. So right there, it, uh, it, it hit the suspicion button for me. Um, from there, I started doing a little bit of research on how the virus originated. Uh, it said that it came from a bat or there was a possibility that it came from a lab in Wuhan. Um, now, it seems that the Australian public has forgotten that where the virus has actually originated from. It seems like everyone in Australia feels like Victoria is the, the main cause of this and we're the ones that are spreading it. Um, and just, just to go back on what was occurring in, like in the world events, Iran was currently going through riots. Hong Kong was going through riots. Italy and France were going through riots. They had the letter, yellow shirt movements. And then once this uh, pandemic came into place, it, it all stopped. So obviously there, it was it, it turned quite political. Um, also from that's, there when the shut... Sorry, that's mate, spot yeah, on. Two, 2019 was the biggest year of protesting ever, ever in the world. So you're really spot on with that um, narrative as well. So, yeah, just once I started seeing that, people actually standing up against their governments and wanting a change, then that psychological fear just came in because the government came up and created this, this scandemic or whatever they wanted to use just to, to scare the public into saying, hey, they've hit you on an emotional level. Um, everyone is a possible. So it's, it's a silent war. There is no more combat war. There's, it's not a physical war where people are walking down the streets with guns or they're dropping bombs on the streets. Now it's a, it's a psychological war. You know, there, there's a silent enemy. There's this silent killer out there where now everyone is the enemy, your, your family, your friends, you know, any, anyone walking down the street, you've got this, this paranoia now that anyone could be carrying the virus. And with this, like I'm no epidemiologist, but um, asymptomatic to me sounds, it, it just sounds quite suspicious that someone that's fit and healthy, that, you know, wants to improve their immune system is now punished for going outside and getting vitamin D or, you know, getting fitness or just being with their family as uh, was stated by some of the other people. Um, from there, uh, once, once the shutdowns came in, I started noticing because of my background, I'm, I'm very observant and I started noticing a massive rollout of uh, 5G towers just popping up all throughout the entire city, uh, in, in the CBD, in the Western suburbs. So it, it started um, like, I, I don't, I'm not a firm believer that it is causing the virus, but it just gave me some sort of suspicion that there is an ulterior motive going ahead. So for it to be rolled out under the cover of COVID and be popping up with when no one can protest this untested technology popping up in our city, it was uh, quite suspicious for me as well. So the more research I'd done, um, it just started uncovering certain things into where it was coming from. So Wuhan was the first place that rolled out 5G. And then um, I started looking into the politics behind that. So with Dan Andrews, his ties to the CCP, his ties to uh, the Metro Tunnel, the Westgate Tunnel, all the railroad movements, Cedar Meats, all this stuff started uh, setting off um, light bulbs in my head saying, well, hang on a sec. Well, Victoria has been a, a, a democratic country for a very long time or a state. And all of a sudden we're just getting used by China, everything. All the steel has come from China. Uh, John Holland was the contractor that has been employed to do the Metro Tunnel and the, the Westgate Tunnel. And uh, they were actually purchased by a Chinese company back in 2015. So right there, that's more suspicion. And also the steel that was used in these tunnels was from China. So if, you, if you're looking at what's happening in China right now, uh, the Three Gorges Dam, they're all collapsing due to rushed materials and rushed labour. Also, it's it's quite a concern. Um, yeah, there's... I'm noticing too. Sorry to cut in there, but 
from the military chat, you guys are obviously trained in um, strategy as well as various other um, tactics. Are you That's seeing right. a bit of the uh, divide and conquer strategy here on the people so that there is, you know, the, the, the government, no. as the B, don't have to do the fighting. They're pitting the people against the people. Exactly right. So divide and conquer. A lot of people forget that um, this is not just Australia. This is a worldwide pandemic. It's not just Victoria that is in a state of lockdown or in a state of pandemic. Um, I think that a lot of people are very naive or a lot of people have never read a history book in their life. Um, they forgot about the Holocaust and how Hitler uh, was able to achieve what he did with uh, the Aryan race. It was a propaganda campaign. He bombarded the Germans uh, and just tell them they were superior. They were superior. He used radio. He used pamphlets. He, he used speeches. And, and this is what I see right now. Our, our government what they've employed here in Victoria, especially through the CBD. You can't go anywhere and escape it. There is posters everywhere. Every time you turn on the radio, it's COVID. Every time you watch the TV, it's COVID. Every time you walk into a shopping centre, they have maintain your social distancing. This is COVID, COVID. And this has been going on for six months. The brainwashing is, it's just absolutely phenomenal right now. And people don't realise that because they are living in a state of fear. We have Stockholm syndrome. We it's it's ridiculous. Like this 100%. is the biggest psyop psyop that I've ever seen in my life. You you were talking too, mate. You again with the training and been trained to be a bit more observant of a few things there. Um, the extra aircraft you've been noticing in Melbourne. Uh, maybe you could fill us in a little bit on that. Uh, what That's you've been correct. noticing so, um, particularly we, at night time. So I've got, I've got a lot of friends that are still currently serving, a lot of friends that are ex, ex military and people that are working for the police force in other states and in this state. So I'm getting uh, updates constantly on what's happening around us. Um, I myself have, have broken curfew many of times just to get a feel of, um, they, they call it the signs of life. So um, I've, I've put myself at risk. I've been pulled up a few times by the police uh, for breaching cur curfew and not wearing a mask just to see what their standing operating procedures are, their line of questioning is, their intimidating tactics, and to also see what they're doing under the cover of night, because that is definitely a military tactic. While everyone's sleeping at night, the enemy's gonna be out there and they're gonna be setting up defensive positions or setting up positions where they can attack you know, their, their enemy. So with the, the aerial pursuits, the helicopters is another tactic to instill fear in the public. They're flying over constantly over suburbs, circling and circling and circling. Um, I've heard like high aerial aeroplanes flying overnight with no lights. Um, and this, you can like, because of my background, you can tell the difference between a normal aviation flight or a Cessna towards like a military drone or a high aviation. And with another thing that I'll, um, I'll mention is uh, the police budget. So. They've had a $3.2 billion budget in the state of Victoria with an extra $3.2 billion of expenditure. So over the last couple of years, we've had a, a decrease in crime. So for any budget to continue, you need to justify the spending. And with that, if they can't justify it, they will lose that budget. So to me, it just rings uh, alarm bells that they're constantly flying over police choppers using all their assets having the police out there 24 7 because the police are becoming obsolete no one's committing crimes everyone's doing the right thing and we are being vilified for you know spending time with our family so it's it's yeah it's very it's quite concerning so very very much from your background then mate a bit of a military tactic for the purpose of spreading and causing fear and That's for correct. the purpose of providing the people to pit them against each other as well that's correct. Yeah, yeah and I, I would agree as well, again, that when those towers got locked down in Melbourne, they were running fire trucks and ambulances past there at night time. A couple of times I followed them, they drove the block, went around the corner and turned off their lights and sirens. So I think there is a lot of that tactic of instilling fear in people so they'll get the testing done as well. Exactly right. So, And it's the same with the media, what they're doing every day. They're just bombarding people with fear. Like it's Dan Andrews has become the spokesman for COVID. Like in a normal circumstance, they're like the resources that have been used. Yeah, just imagine the taxpayers' money that's going into the advertising on the radios and all the propaganda that's being used to to instill fear in in the uh, the public of Melbourne and Australia because it's just it's social engineering and it's social conditioning to think that this is you know this is normal. It's it's definitely not normal. Yeah, and it's leading towards a state of full surveillance. 
and it's leading towards a state of mandatory vaccinations. The fact that they're saying you won't be able to travel for two years, you're going to have to wear masks for two years, is setting people up psychologically so that when a vaccine comes out, they'll line up for it. Exactly right. And and people have uh, actually gotten quite upset with me that I've compared the, the Australian Defence Force and the Australian Police Force or uh, Victorian Police Force as Gestapo. And I, I, like I've, I've, I've read a lot into history of their tactics and what they do, and, and it just goes hand in hand. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's the slow erosion of our rights until there's none left at all, and it's not until that point where there are no rights left that everyone goes, hey, what happened to our rights? Well, they've been eroding them slowly for a long time, guys, and it's, it's crunch time, time we all united. We didn't buy into this fear BS. Exactly. And, and it's so un-Australian yeah. to, to, to rat out your mates. You know, you, you're meant to be like I served for 10 years. I fought overseas for like on two tours. And, and that's mateship was you're, you're in the trenches with your mates. You know, the Anzacs, the traditions, the rats at the brook, the diggers, yeah. that mentality, that that mateship that, you know, you, you're there to stand by your mate regardless of season, weather or terrain. And now, right now, they're turning us against each other. They're turning you to the to the core level of being afraid to visit your own family. I think you're spot on. I've, I've uh, put up posts like that myself about the Anzac spirit. Like I spoke to an older man the other day who wasn't wearing a mask. And I said to him, why aren't you wearing a mask today? And he said, we didn't fight in the wars for our freedom to die as a slave. Exactly right. I'd rather die standing than live on my knees. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Better to die on your feet than live on your knees. And many of us are with you 100% on that. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I appreciate it. No, thank you for coming on, mate. No, I'm just, yeah, and speaking out and just giving people a bit of, a bit of feedback from a, another perspective that many wouldn't probably have access to, to hear it from a, from a military background, a perspective, uh, a different uh, viewpoint, different angle to look at things from. So Definitely. I'll, um, I'll, touch, I'll touch on one more topic before I leave. So um, I, I'm guessing a lot of people have watched uh, Agenda 201, uh, so they, they planned for this. They, this is, um, to me, it felt like it's during the first wave. Yes, I, I personally felt that this was quite serious, the way uh, China portrayed it, uh, that the propaganda that they used to instill fear in the Australian public. Um, I, I, t- I, took, I took the bait. I definitely did. Um, from there, I, st- I started to really realise that this, this wasn't right. This was t- definitely turning into a scam, a pandemic. And after watching Agenda 201, it really put things into perspective. They, they plan this as a military operation. And they have said and stated that they will collect all the data of what's occurring. They, this is what we call in the army an after action review. So at the end of all this, they are going to accumulate all the information that they've acquired over the last six months. And they will submit it to the powers that be. And they'll say, this is how the people complied. This is how they long they complied for. This is where the resistance was. This is what, you know, different types of certain things. This is how um, transportation worked. And, and they're just going to continue to try this until they, they've, they've perfected it. Well, last, last quick one for you there, mate, while we're, while we're pushing it for time too much. Um, any info or intel you able to uh, be forthcoming with uh, regarding the rowies that any of your mates have uh, forwarded on to you? So the, the, the one that was quite concerning was um, some people, a lot of the soldiers coming from interstate. So right now the, the Defence Force or the Army personnel, Navy and Air Force, they are actually trained medics that are conducting the nasal swabs. Um, they have currently flown in uh, a lot of CFAs from all around Australia. CFAs are combat first aiders. These guys are unqualified and they are not medical practitioners. They are going to start conducting, conducting the nasal swabs and testing people for COVID around Victoria and around Australia. And also these medics in Australia are quite concerned about these combat first aiders flying in without the qualification conducting these nasal swabs. Yeah, and, and our rows, our ROEs that you guys have been all... At the moment, yeah, so, so the, the rules of engagement like? at the moment, they're like... They're unarmed, so they're just here. What an ROE is? So, uh, yep, ROE is a rule of engagement, and SOP is the standard operating procedures. So, every soldier's briefed on this before they deploy. So, they're currently under the operation COVID assist, and they've been uh, directed to just assist the police force. They haven't been given any directions to detain or restrain anyone, but within my experience, uh, these ROEs and SOPs can change overnight. 
Um, all they need to do is receive a set of orders and within, within overnight, they, they could be armed and patrolling the streets and restraining families and conducting mandatory vaccinations. Well, there you go. So a bit of inside intel for everybody. Um, and MJ and Sergio, these mates of yours, are they? Yes, mate. All right. Well, if you guys want to speak out a little bit, anything you'd like to put forward from MJ and Sergio, feel free, guys. Now's your chance. Um, yeah, I think um, it's, this is my first Moon conference, uh, Zoom conference. So I think um, I just try to let them know what was occurring. I think they've just joined randomly. So... That's all right. Well, look for for MJ and Sergio if you guys want to have a. Uh, I'll flick his little ask to unmute. If you guys want to come on and have anything to say, please feel free. Um, some more intel is always good to get um, different perspective from a from a point of view that most civilians wouldn't have access to. So again, mate, muchly appreciate you coming on and uh, having a chat with everyone tonight, and just to no give that different viewpoint that most wouldn't have access to. Thank you. Stay safe, guys, and thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Right, doesn't look like the there. other guys want to. Doesn't look like they're going to speak. Maybe I'm not sure. No, no I don't. I don't think they will be. I think they'll just observing. That's all right. All right. No worries. <laughs> the mates are yours, then we're all good there, mate. So that's sort of problem there. Look, no, before we wrap it up, Troy, you, you've been relatively quiet. Other than that, anything you want to add to or viewpoint? Anything you want to say to that? No, I think the the number one thing that like, I think most people are not sure what to do. I think if something doesn't make sense, listen to your gut and, and follow, follow your heart. And that's exactly what I did because, you know, something wasn't right. And I was like, I need to investigate this. I need to ask some questions. So if you're not sure about anything, I think it's important to listen to your gut, ask the questions, and then you'll get the answers. And then eventually things are going to start coming out. And then for the people out there that are a bit nervous to stand up, like I said, I was very nervous. Like even when I, like I did that video the other day, I was extremely nervous. Even, even right now I am because it's all very fresh. Like my uncle only just passed away and it's very difficult to talk about. So I'm sure there are many other, you know, families out there. There are many other people out there that are affected. I think the best thing to do and the best thing for me to do, and I feel great about it was to stand up. And I encourage anyone that has just even a, just a slight inkling or just a little bit in them, anything that's in you, inside you, that you, you know what to do. You need to stand up and, you know, have a conversation, get in contact with, one of the guys here and even Serene, who's also representing me, like I said, she's been nothing but great. And, um, you know, this is only the beginning because there's no end game in sight right now. So we don't know what tomorrow is going to look like. We don't know if this is going to be another three months, six months, 12 months. When are you going to stand up? You know, I think the time is now for everyone to realize that this isn't going to go away unless we do something about it as Australians. And it's important for us to all stand together. That's amazing, Troy. And um, I'll just say one last thing from my perspective. Um, with our ADF guy that came on board, it's not something to be fearful of, the things that he's putting out there. It's something to be aware of. So if you're not aware, then you're asleep. You need to actually um, understand that if you come outside of that, um, that thought process where you've got your blinkers on and you're just watching mainstream media, once you open up those blinkers and have a look outside, you'll see the narrative is breaking down. And my gut feeling is the people in power, the people in government are fighting amongst themselves now because there's so much that doesn't quite add up. And people who have been put into their homes, although they've been fearful, a lot of people are researching a lot. So there's a lot of information being found. A lot of it's in plain sight. A lot of it these guys like to put right there for you to be able to find, but they don't expect you to look for it really, but they have to legally put it into legislation a lot of the time. If you find anything that's not quite right, if you're in a hospital and a loved one passes away and it's not quite right, if you feel like you're getting pressure to do testing when you don't think you're sick or there's no reason why you should be, stand your ground, come from a place of strength and love and peace and um, together we can all make a big difference. There are things happening in the background. We're not going to let everyone suffer alone. If you're feeling unwell, if you're feeling um, suicidal, if you're feeling like you can't go on, reach out, speak to someone. doesn't matter who it is say something and if you know a friend that's gone quiet speak to them don't just say are you okay ask them about their day don't give them a yes no answer ask them what they're up to how they've been what's going on we can be the strength for those people the ones who are awake now can be the shining light for everyone else and as i keep on saying one stone dropped in the water is going to cause a ripple effect whether it's troy or someone else who puts that in there 
it can cause the whole narrative to change and we're we're here to do that now so i'll pass it back to you again zev all right yeah look we've gone a bit over an hour guys a little over time so we might wrap it up again massive thank you troy especially with everything you've got going on with your family and what you've just been through for taking the time and um and the bravery just to come on and speak out about this publicly um, don't imagine that's easy for anyone to do. So again, mate, hats off to you. Uh, yeah. And just for everyone else watching, guys, look, together, united and without the fear, that's the only way forward from here. So if we're, we're not giving in to the fear, uh, there's loads of us out there happy to support people who want to come forward and speak out, provide a platform for that. Um, again, big thank you to, to Pete, to our anonymous artist, uh, to our nurse X, um, our, our military friend that came on as well, just to give another perspective, um, and all other guests that have come on, um, just everyone who's put their, their two cents worth in. And Serene, of course, your, your passion is, is amazing, Serene, and I really hope that um, that rubs off on a few more of these morally bankrupt lawyers. I know there are some good ones out there, but guys, where are you? We need you. Um, and let Serene's, you know, she's uh, blazing a trial there for what lawyers should be doing. So just, uh, again, uh, massive thank you to everyone for coming on tonight, sharing your info and your stories. And uh, again, Troy, speaking from the heart, mate, with everything you've been on, just uh, much appreciated. Yeah, thank love the Troy. opportunity. Thanks, mate. I really thank you guys for the opportunity. All right, look, thank you guys. It's been a pleasure. We might call this one a night as we've gone a bit over time. Uh, and again, thank you to everyone that came on and joined us and to everyone for watching supporting uh, i'm going to have a look at the comments in a minute and just yeah again big thank you everybody united we stand it's the only way forward guys i'm frozen up all right call it i don't think it's turned off yet bye everyone oh. <laughs> see, you. <laughs> see you guys thank you see you later